Okay, everybody, I am going to bring us to order. I'm Don Moynihan. I'm the director of the La Follette School of Public Affairs. And uh, thank you for coming to this. Uh, this is a part of a lecture series, Behavioral Insights in Government. It's an effort by the La Follette School to get off the campus, come downtown, and engage with members of the public and policymakers, and present new and exciting research that we think has a lot of uh, policy relevance. Uh, today's speaker, Jennifer Doliak, is uh, one of the most outstanding young economists studying criminal justice policy in the country. She's done a series of really amazing and high-profile studies on this topic uh, because today is DNA Day. I did not know this until this morning. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's hashtag DNA Day today. I think Perfect. we're celebrating Watson and Crick. Um, we uh, have a topic <laughs> that relates to DNA and the role of DNA in uh, criminal justice policy. And I've also asked Jennifer to talk about some of her prior work on uh, studying the effects of band of box policies in criminal justice. Uh, Jennifer is here this week in uh, uh, league with the Thompson Center. So if you want to get more criminal justice policy in the downtown area, they are holding a conference uh, tomorrow and Friday uh, down where? Monona on Monona Terrace, which is free and open to the public. They have a lot of speakers from around the country talking about criminal justice reform. So you are welcome to sign up for that. If you just Google Thompson Center, Wisconsin, you are, can RSVP online and join them there. Uh, but other than that, feel free to grab more pizza if you need it, more soda, um, and I will let Jennifer take the stage. Great, thank you so much. And yeah, we could not have planned that DNA thing if we tried, I think, uh, so quite a coincidence. Uh, so yeah, so I'm gonna talk uh, today about two separate studies. Uh, this is the first time I've, I've presented them sort of side by side, and uh, I'm not sure I want you to read too much into them as like alternative ways to reduce recidivism, but uh, they do pr provide a nice contrast, I think, in terms of how people think about this problem. Uh, so, um, so the first paper, uh, the first uh, line of work, um, as Don mentioned, is on ban the box. Um, and uh, so the, the policy problem we have in mind here is that two thirds of those who are released from prison are rearrested within three years. Um, and so if we want to, uh, to address that, to, if we want to reduce our dependence on mass incarceration, we're obviously going to have to do something to, uh, to break that incarceration cycle. Um, and unfortunately, there's relatively little evidence at this point on, uh, to, to guide policymakers uh, who, who want to implement evidence-based policies that could, could reduce recidivism rates. Um, so I'm going to talk about, uh, briefly, Ban the Box, and then, um, which will be a preview of what I'm going to talk about tomorrow at the Thompson Center, um, and then I'll, I'll dive into my work on DNA databases. So Ban the Box is a, uh, a very popular policy that, um, uh, at this point, uh, is, has been implemented, I think, across most of the country. Um, it prevents employers from asking job applicants about their criminal records until late in the hiring process. And now the goal here is that is to allow people who have a record to get their foot in the door um, and uh, to signal their work readiness during an interview when otherwise an employer might have just turned them away and screened them um, based on the, uh, the box that traditionally you had to check on an application saying that you have a criminal record or not. Um, so that map shows you where Ban the Box was in effect by the end of 2015. Uh, as I said, I think at this point, it's um, a whole lot more of the country is, has been covered, but it's become a very popular policy. Uh, the, potential pol the potential problem with Ban the Box is that if employers don't want to hire people with criminal records and they're not allowed to ask up front, they might try to guess. Um, and so uh, given that there are lar large racial disparities in this country in terms of who, who is involved with the criminal justice system and who isn't, um, a good proxy that employers could use if they want to try to guess who has a record um, is, is race. And so the concern is that, that employers might uh, avoid interviewing young black men because they assume that they're more likely to have a record than, um, than other applicants. And so there are now two papers uh, that show that Ban the Box does seem to have that effect, that it increases racial discrimination in hiring. One is by Amanda Egan and Sonia Starr. Um, they ran a field experiment in New Jersey and New York City where they submitted thousands of job applications from fake applicants before and after Ban the Box went into effect in those places. Um, and they found that Ban the Box increased racial disparities in callbacks. So you could see um, the first two sets of bars are before Ban the Box. The last two are, are after Ban the Box. So the first two are um, black and white applicants with a criminal history. 
and the next two are black and white applicants with no criminal history. As you can see in these places, um, there's actually no racial gap within the category of whether or not you have a criminal record. Not all studies have found that. Sometimes there's an additional racial gap. But certainly those with a criminal risk history are called back at much lower rates than those without, um, which is the problem that, that Ban the Box advocates have been trying to solve. Um, but then when they find that when, after Ban the Box goes into effect and the, that, that box is no longer there and employers can't ask up front, what happens is that employers call back black applicants at a rate that's in between the, the rate they were called back before. Um, assuming that there are a mix of people with and without criminal records, and they're calling back the white applicants at a rate that is, if anything, higher than it was before, um, assuming that, see, they seem to be assuming that none of the white applicants have a criminal record. So, uh, so the punchline there is that ban the box is increasing racial disparities in callbacks. Now the question is what happens, who actually gets a job, right? So since these are fake job applicants, they can't see who winds up actually getting getting a job in the end, they can just see who gets their foot in the door. And of course, at the end of the process, the employers can still do a background check before they, they make the hiring decision. So a lot of the people who might have gotten their foot in the door might still not get their the, a job in the end. And so I have a paper with Ben Hansen uh, where we use the gradual rollout of ban-the-box policies across the country to test the impact on um, on employment. So the advantage of the Egan and Starr study was a, it was a really nice randomized experiment. Uh, the downside is they couldn't actually see employment. For us, uh, we're able to see actual employment, but it's not as clean an experiment, right? So we're using the, the policy changes as a natural experiment and kind of doing the best we can to measure the causal impact of them on employment rates. And so um, we test the effect of ban the box policies on employment for young, low-skilled men. These are the, the group that is most likely to have a recent conviction. Um, that employers might be worried about. And we find that, and these graphs are showing basically the, the error terms from our, from our regression, uh, showing kind of the leftover variation um, from our main specification. So for white, for white applicants, we basically we see no impact of ban the box in this case. Um, for black applicants, we see that uh, young black men who live in non-ban the box places uh, do better on the job market than those who live in places that adopt ban the box. So what we wind up finding is that uh, Ban the Box reduces employment for black men by 3.4 percentage points, about 5%. Reduces employment for Hispanic men by about 3%. Um, it has no effect on white men on average. Although when we restrict attention to private Ban the Box laws, which are um, Ban the Box policies that apply to private firms, um, then we do see an impact, uh, an increase in employment for white men, which is in line with the Egan and Starr study. So we have two studies now that show that there are these unintended consequences of ban the box laws, right? So they basically, maybe they're helping people with criminal records, but they're hurting young black men who don't have records, who now are not able to signal that up front on their, their application. So the question is what happens to people with criminal records? Um, now there are two nice studies showing that um, they don't seem to be helped by this either. Um, so I think the best study of these is one by Evan Rose, who's a grad student at Berkeley. He looks at the impact of ban the box on people with criminal records in Seattle relative to people with records in other parts of Washington state. Um, and he, so he links criminal history data with unemployment insurance data on, um, which shows uh, employment, administrative data on employment. Um, and basically finds like that red vertical line is, the, is when the ban box law went into effect, basically finds like no change across the board there. Um, it's essentially a zero impact on both uh, employment and earnings. Um, another study that does something similar where they link criminal history data to uh, to employment data finds that, ban if anything, ban the box reduced employment for people with criminal records in Massachusetts. Um, this is consistent with a story where basically people are now wasting their time interviewing for jobs that they weren't going to get. Um, and so uh, might uh, be less likely to wind up being employed at all. Um, I think another kind of, uh, you know, th Another set of studies that's important to think about in the context of this, this evidence on ban the box is, uh, is what the impact of just giving someone a job is. So there have actually been a, a number of pretty large scale randomized control trials now um, uh, on providing transitional jobs to people who are coming out of prison. Um, you know, if, the, if the goal here, if, uh, you know, the motivation for ban the box is we think that, uh, that employment can reduce recidivism. If you give someone a job, it will help them kind of build a more stable life um, that doesn't involve criminal activity. Uh, you know, if we want people to have a job, maybe we should just give them a job, right? And so these transitional jobs programs have tried that. Um, and uh, so it gives you a job for about six months, 
uh, helps you build some soft skills, maybe some job specific skills. That's the hope is that will help you transition to a, a private sector job after that. So there have been some nice randomized trials where they, they randomly give some people jobs and not others. Um, and they, they have found no impact on long-term employment and little or no impact on recidivism. So you know, one, one kind of takeaway for me in all of this is our focus on employment might be somewhat misguided here. Um, it could be that a job is nice to have, but not necessary or sufficient um, to, to reduce recidivism. Um, and you know, people with, com with criminal records, people who are coming out of prison face a whole bunch of other challenges that are not just the lack of employment. Uh, so you know, higher rates of mental illness, higher rates of substance abuse, emotional trauma, uh, low education levels, and all of those other challenges might be the reasons that they don't have a job, um, but are also driving recidivism rates. And so um, you know, if we're able to somehow address those other, it might, it might be more important to address those other problems first. So that's, that's what I'm going to tell you about Ban the Box. If you are interested in this, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm part of a panel first thing tomorrow morning, um, and hopefully it'll be a good conversation. So hope to see some of you there. So now I'm going to turn to DNA databases. A very different approach to, uh, to trying to reduce recidivism. And here I'm going to talk about work from both the US and Denmark. Um, so the background here is that uh, DNA databases and a variety of other similar high-tech tools are um, increasingly popular around the world. Uh, and they, they mostly work by increasing the probability that someone gets caught for committing a crime rather than increasing the sentence. So, if we think about, I'm an economist, so we think about you know, a, a rational model of criminal behavior. If we want to discourage someone or deter someone from committing crime, uh, we try to increase the expected cost of, of committing that crime. And we can do that either by increasing the probability they get caught or the penalty, right? And for a long time in the US, just really focused on that penalty, um, putting people in prison for longer and longer periods of time. And what this type of tool is, is, is aiming to do is, is to change the, you know, making it more likely you get caught so that maybe we don't have to put you in prison for as long if we can get the same kind of same bang for less fewer bucks maybe um, so these tool, these types of tools have a lot of potential I think they're really exciting to a lot of people but of course um, they they have privacy costs they have some financial costs but they're actually pretty low relative to a lot of other uh, things because we're spending our money on but the the main cost people worry about here is privacy and um, the government is collecting your DNA after all um, so citizens want to know what they're getting in exchange for that privacy. Um, and and up, up until now, there's been relatively little evidence on what impact DNA databases are having um, on, uh, on outcomes we might care about. So government, the, the US government and, and states collect basically the number of matches that the computer makes between an, an offender and a crime scene evidence. And I'll tell you more about how these work in a moment. Um, and they, they label this in the investigations aided. But that doesn't really tell you the real value add of this tool over um, over you know, investigation as usual. Some of those matches would have been made by a detective or by a police officer. So what we really want to know is what impact does this type of tool have on crime rates, on clearance rates, or on recidivism. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, the impacts of DNA databases on recidivism uh, using the timing of database expansions as a natural experiment in both the United States and Denmark. Uh, so a couple caveats. As I mentioned, I'm an economist, and so my interest here is in how incentives affect behavior, um, in, in the cost effectiveness of different types of tools, um, and, and economists really focus on distinguishing correlation from causation. So we try to you know, look for these natural experiments that could, can get us some, um, uh, something similar to a treatment in a control group, right? So we can kind of tell what the impact of the policy is. This is not going to be a talk about the science of DNA, uh, or the legal implications of DNA databases or the use of DNA evidence in court. I might be able to answer some questions on that, but that is not my main area of expertise. So um, you shouldn't expect those answers to be very good. Uh, um, so, so what I'm going to be talking about is measuring the causal effect of adding offenders to a DNA database on their criminal behavior. Um, I'm going to talk about what the impact of the policy is on public safety and kind of in the end a little bit of a discussion of whether the benefits seem worth the costs. So how do DNA databases work? Um, databases, the, the goal here is to, to, it's to match profiled offenders with crime scene evidence. So, um, so if you are an offender who uh, is required by law to provide a DNA sample, um, you, you will, um, they'll take a, a sample of your DNA with a saliva swab, uh, 
um, and then analyze that saliva swab to create a DNA profile. It's basically, you can think of it as a string of numbers that identifies you, similar to a social security number. The numbers themselves don't really mean anything, but it's identifying. Um, and so it's, it's based on 20 loci on your, on, on your DNA. Uh, there's no sensitive personal information there, um, although one could that's the slippery slope into the nightmare that people, people imagine when they hear the government's collecting your DNA. You could obviously, if the science gets better, you could obviously learn a lot about someone using their DNA, but that's not what they're doing when they collect it for this tool. They're just coming up with that identifying string of numbers. And then that profile is constantly compared with DNA profiles from crime scenes. Um, and then so when a match is made, uh, uh, law enforcement is notified, they can get a warrant for um, for the DNA of that, of that suspect. So the goal here is to identify people as suspects in crime who would not otherwise have been identified. If someone's already a suspect, you can get a warrant for their DNA sample. So the goal here is, is to find people who might not have otherwise been on your radar who are a match to the evidence in the, from the crime scenes. Um, and so local law is gonna determine who is required to provide a DNA sample. Um, in the United States, that's legislated at the state level. Most countries, it's the national level. Um, and they are typically expanded over time. So most places have started with the most serious offenders, uh, the murderers and the rapists, um, and, and have gradually expanded to include more minor offenders. Um, they've also tended to evolve from people who are con convicted of crime to people who are just arrested. Um, and have also, uh, more and more states are, are allowing kind of partial, partial match searches or familial searches um, that will basically use, look for, partial matches to, of crime scene evidence to offenders who are in the database that could potentially identify like the son of someone who was profiled um, by the database. So it effectively expands the database to include family members of people who were profiled in the past. So a lot of the countries in the world have these types of databases. This is a somewhat outdated map at this point, but the, um, the red countries are those that already have a database and the pink ones, had, it was planned at that point. Um, but worldwide, this is a very popular tool. And there are two main reasons that we might think the DNA databases would be especially effective. Uh, one is that there are tremendous returns to scale. So there's a big fixed cost in kind of building the labs that you need and build the computer equipment. Um, but adding an additional DNA sample to an existing system is, is super cheap. Um, and that's very different from kind of more typical uh, law enforcement or, or crime reduction tools like hiring an additional police officer or building an additional prison, say, um, or adding it, you know, putting someone in prison for an, an additional year. That, that all is going to cost a lot of money. Um, and the other way that it's different, as I mentioned before, is that databases work primarily by increasing the probability of punishment rather than the punishment itself. And so if this works, um, if people are, are, you know, if the short run consequences are more, um, uh, you know, matter more to the, the typical offender than the potential long-run consequences of their actions, which seems, ra seems, seems likely uh, if most, most criminals aren't particularly forward-looking, um, then, then we could get a lot more deterrence for much less money um, if, we, if we try to deter more crime in this way than if we try to deter it by putting people in prison for a long time. Um, and so the, one of the reasons that DNA databases are really interesting to me is that they're rep really representative of a broader class of high-tech tools that all have those, those same features. Um, so we have you know, surveillance cameras, electronic monitoring, blood alcohol content monitors, gunshot sensors. Um, all of these enable what is often called swift and certain punishment, um, uh, which is e e the, basically the idea that you, you, you quickly and accurately punish someone for their crime rather than, increase, rather than focusing on the severity of the punishment. Um, and there's increasing empirical evidence that that has a really big deterrent effect on criminal behavior. Uh, but all of those types of tools involve privacy costs. And so I think it's interesting to, uh, to try to quantify those, the benefits that we get from them so we can have a more informed conversation about whether they're worth the costs involved. Um, otherwise, these just kind of wind up turning into screaming matches um, that aren't very productive. Okay, so here's the basic. Here's going to be the basic, um, you know, the the basic strategy I'm going to use to to look at the impacts of DNA databases in these two countries. Uh, so I want to measure the effect of DNA collection on the probability of committing another crime later. 
So I'm going to use the effective date of the database expansion as a natural experiment. So let's imagine I have two identical offenders here. One scheduled for release on June 30th, one scheduled for release on July 1st. We have a database expansion that goes into effect July 1st. The first guy now does not go in the database. He gets out of prison before it the law changes. The second guy does go in the database. And so I'm going to find the first guy is much more likely to show up in prison again. And I'm going to be able to attribute that difference to the effect of DNA profiling, because otherwise there's nothing, there's nothing changing suddenly at that threshold other than the policy. Right? So that's the basic idea of what I'm going to do with both the US data and the Denmark data. So, uh, so the context in the US, you know, crime rates are relatively high here, especially violent crime rates are much higher than in Denmark. Um, we have lots of policy variation across the country, which is really helpful for a study like this. Um, but data availability in the US is really limited and not ideal. Um, it's always a, it's a constant challenge. Um, the, other, the other feature of, of the analysis in the U US is that I'm going to be looking at the effect of DNA database profiling for those convicted of serious felonies. So we're looking at convicts only. In the paper, uh, using Danish data, there are lower crime rates in, in Denmark, especially violent crimes. Um, and, but way better data in Denmark. Um, so gonna be, we're going to be able to look at um, a, lot more, a lot more things and a lot more detail. And as you'll see in the graphs, it just uh, leads to much clearer, much clearer interpretations of what's going on. And the, other, but the, and the other really interesting thing about Denmark is that there the big uh, policy change was adding people who were charged with a felony, which is the policy frontier in the United States at this point. Most states that are trying to decide what to do with their databases or trying to decide whether or not to add felony arrestees. They've already added the convicts, and they're trying to decide whether to, to add people charged with a felony. Um, and so, so that's what the Denmark analysis will be able to speak directly to. In both cases, I'm going to find that being added to a DNA, DNA database has a really large deterrent effect. OK, so in the United States, um, the, the very first DNA databases were in Colorado and Virginia. Uh, in the late 1980s. By 1999, um, with uh, huge support from the, the federal government, which was really pushing this, every United States state had established an offender DNA database. At this point, all of those databases are linked by the FBI into a federal system called CODIS. Um, currently, there are about 13.3 million offender profiles and 3.1 million arrestee profiles in CODIS. Um, as I mentioned, states usually start with the more violent, more, more serious offenders, the violent um, felony convicts, then they add property felons. Um, most, most states at, you know, started with everyone who's currently incarcerated for the crime as well. Um, and one, one interesting feature of this policy is that, and this is similar to a lot of other criminal justice policies uh, or reforms, um, the DNA databases really appealed to both liberal and conservative governments alike. This wasn't viewed as like a tough on crime policy. Um, this was is often framed as a way to, um, to focus on catching the right person rather than to be tougher on the people that you're catching. Um, and so DNA databases are also often used to help exonerate people who are wrongly, wrongfully convicted. Um, a lot of times in practice, you have to actually identify the person who did commit the crime in order to get the other guy out, um, unfortunately. Um, and so databases can be really helpful for that. Um, I also think it's interesting, you know, one of the potential benefits that this, this um, tool can have is it could potentially reduce racial bias in the criminal justice system by making objective matches rather than depending on kind of the hunches of police officers or lawyers or prosecutors. Um, and so the more you kind of take the human element out of any decision making, the less bias you, you wind up with. So the data I'm going to have here are from seven US states, um, sort of a, a random sample based on who got back to me with data. Uh, but um, so it's individual level data for people released before 2007. I'm focusing on men only because they're the ones who commit most of the crime. Uh, so there's just more action there. Um, and these data are going to include all the details on their, their current and previous convictions, uh, dates of incarceration spells, um, including the, the release date that was determined at sentencing, which is what I'm going to use to determine whether or not they, they were added to the database, um, and some basic demographics. In the US data, and one big difference from what I'm going to use in Denmark, 
we don't actually know who was put into the database. I'm going to look at their incarceration dates and their conviction records to figure out who should have been added to the database based on state law. So this is going to be sort of an intent to treat um, for those who know what that means. OK, so this is, this is, uh, these, these are the, the, um, the threshold that I'm, I'm going to be using here. So this is state by state showing you the, the red lines are the database expansions. And then what you can see is it a, a bunch of those different lines, you see um, uh, an increase in the probability that people are added to the database. So on the y-axis is the, the probability that DNA was required, or basically the share of people uh, released on that date who should have been added to the database. And so at a bunch of those different dates, you see a big jump. And those are the jumps that I'm going to be using um, where we have on one side, if you happen to release the day before, you don't go in the database. If you happen to be released the day after, you're much more likely to go into the database. So those are the jumps that we're going to be using to identify the effect of the database on recidivism. So then follow the, all those people over time to see what happens to them. So these are violent offenders. You see the same kinds of jumps with the property offenders. And then when you kind of combine all those states together, you do again see these nice discontinuities in, um, in the likelihood that you're going to be added to the DNA database based on the date that you're scheduled, originally scheduled for release. Um, so the outcome I'm going to be looking at here is the likelihood of a new conviction within three or five years. Um, one of the big challenges in studying this type of tool is, is because it, in, it, changes the, it increases the likelihood that you get caught for an offense, it, even if like nothing else changes, if nothing about your behavior changes, you're now going to be more likely to show up in the data later. It's going to look like you're offending more just because you're caught more often, right? And so there's, there's going to be some deterrent effect, but it's going to be kind of canceled out in the data a little bit by the detection effect of DNA. So what I'm going to be measuring is basically the net of those two effects. Um, and so the way to interpret that is if I, if I see a decrease in the likelihood of a subsequent conviction, that means the deterrent effect is outweighing the detection effect. If I see what looks like an increase in recidivism, then, it's gonna, then that will mean that the detection effect is outweighing the deterrent effect. So I'm going to be measuring the, um, the net of these two effects. As you'll see, it's just a big net deterrent effect. But that's, we can think of that as sort of a, a lower bound here. We won't have that problem in the Danish study, which is um, as, as you'll see. So this is, these are the outcome measures. As you can see, it's super noisy with these US data. But what seems to be happening is there's a slight decline on average in the, um, the probability of a new conviction within five years for these, these types of offenders. And when I put up the big table, basically the, the, the highlighted section at the end is showing you that there's a strong net deterrent effect for violent offenders. So there's a 17% reduction in the likelihood of a new conviction over five years. Um, and that's strongly statistically significant, really robust to lots of different controls and so on. Um, there's a net deterrent effect for property offenders too. It's only 6%. It's much less robust. But for violent offenders, it really seems to be there. We can also look at, um, so one of the other things here is there's, there definitely seems to be a, the effect grows over time. And one of the, I can break it out by type, the type of offense that, that um, uh, they, were, they were initially charged with and see that you know, some of the, the, the crimes where um, the, uh, the effect, the deterrent effect really seemed to grow over time were for rape, robbery, and larceny. Um, so I think the, the way to interpret that is there's some learning over time in the power of, of uh, DNA to, uh, to catch people. And you know, those are, rape might, make, probably might be the type of crime that makes the most sense. Their DNA would be really, um, uh, really useful. For robbery and larceny, I think one way to, to think about this is that a lot of people who are committing crime are committing lots of different types of crimes. So um, if you're just sort of, you know, go, if your behavior is getting better, you're not, you're not involved in criminal activity in general, then we would see larceny rates go down. Um, and so, uh, so we see big benefits across both, both violent and property crimes. So on average, across these seven states, what I'm finding in the US is that um, DNA profiling reduced observed recidivism by 17% for violent offenders, 6% for property offenders. Um, as I said, this is basically a lower bound on the deterrent effect because it's going to be basically the net of both the deterrent and detection effects. Um, and the, the really the large effects for larceny convicts and the, and the robbery convicts 
I think really suggests that catching people earlier in their criminal careers can have a, a lot of impact. Uh, I think there's sort of traditionally uh, people think that um, they think about these tools, you know, you want to get the most violent offenders into the database, but the most violent offenders are going to be in prison for a really long time. So it actually doesn't, there's not a lot, uh, uh, there's a, a limited amount that it can, it can help in terms of deterring crime out on the streets. People you want to get in there, the people who are going to be uh, back out on the streets very quickly um, and, and could potentially get into more trouble. Okay, so now I'm going to turn to Denmark. We've got the cooler data. So this is Denmark. Uh, it's home to the Little Mermaid and some uh, open face sandwiches that are very famous and amazing data. And any researchers in the room have probably heard about just the, I mean, they just have, they keep like amazing data on everybody uh, and no one there seems to mind. So um, researchers get to use them. Um, so Denmark's database was first established in 2000. Um, and it initially only included those charged with a very serious violent crime, and even then only when DNA was relevant to the investigation. So if they didn't need to do a DNA match, then you weren't required to be added to the database. In 2005, uh, they uh, enacted a, a huge expansion of their DNA database um, and added anyone charged with a crime punishable by at least one and a half years, which is roughly comparable to anyone charged with a felony in the United States. Um, they also removed that requirement about the relevance of the investigation. So it also then added a whole bunch of more, much more serious offenders who would not have had other, uh, didn't have to add their DNA before. So effective on May 25th of, uh, of 2005 was this big expansion. And the one kind of caveat and all in the, the um, uh, wrench they threw into this is that that was right at the beginning of summer. And in Europe, people take real summer vacations, including the police. And so everyone was on summer holiday uh, when it went into effect, and that meant the police departments were very understaffed um, through August, uh, and so implementation was super slow. So as you'll see in the graph, there's just like this like really lag in implementation while everyone's on summer vacation. Possibly also the criminals were on summer vacation, so maybe it doesn't matter, but, um, but we'll wind up dropping those months because we think they're probably kind of weird. Uh, but, uh, but in general, as you'll see kind of on the next slide, there's this huge increase in the likelihood that you are added to the database if you're charged with a crime, um, but it's going to take till about October to get there. So that's that that graph. So we kind of in blue are the the main date the the dates that we're going to use in our analysis. We're going to drop those gray dates that are basically the summer vacation months. But as you can see, it basically increases the likelihood. So if you're charged for a crime, there it goes from like a four percent chance that you're added to the database to about a forty percent chance. Um, by, by about October. So it's a huge share of the people who are being charged with offenses in Denmark. So as I mentioned, Denmark has amazing data. Um, so we, we have uh, longitudinal criminal history data for the full country. It includes um, when each individual was added to the database, as well as the timing and details of all the future offenses and charges. Um, we're going to focus on recidivism over one to three years from the date of the charge. Uh, it turns out a lot of crime in Denmark is committed by tourists, so we're dropping all the tourists because we can't connect them to other, uh, other Danish data. Um, again, only looking at men, focusing on those 18 to 30 because that's, that's the age range where men get into trouble. Um, and we're linking all this information with, with um, data from the Danish register, in particular marriage, residents, and children to get a sense of whether, you know, if we do see a big drop in recidivism, does this affect other areas of their life? Um, can, we, can we see that show up at all? So I'm going to basically use the same strategy as before, that, that discontinuity um, to compare people released just, or in this case charged, just before and after the date of the expansion. Uh, dropping those summer months. And, oh, as before, um, you know, one of the big challenges here is that it, it, you increase the likelihood of getting caught. That's going to, uh, you know, even if no behavior changes, now you're, gonna, you're more likely to be in the data. Here we have better data, so we can actually do something about that. So it turns out um, that in order to analyze crime scene evidence, it, it, it takes a little while, right? And so uh, if, if you commit, if the, an offense is, is committed on a certain date and you're charged with the crime very soon thereafter, there's no way the DNA database led them to you, right? And so you, you, it, the detection effect could not have been, could not have played a role there. So any effect that we see on those fast charges, we're going to call them fast charges, any effect that we see on those will be a pure deterrent effect. And that's going to allow us to separate the deterrent effects and the detection effects of these DNA databases. So 
This is the impact of, um, of DNA registration or being added to the database on the, the likelihood of any new conviction. So the top, gra the top uh, graph is showing you for everyone, all new charges. So you can see it's pretty flat up until the law change and then, then it starts declining. Um, these, this graph here is those fast charges where we've got a very clean measure of the deterrent effect. Um, and there it's, a, it's a, an even bigger drop. For the slow charges where we've got, you know, what you can imagine going on there is you've got a deterrent effect, but then it's canceled out by the detection effect. Then there's, there's less of an obvious change. So it really seems to be a big deterrent effect, especially when you look at that, that fast charge graph. If we look at the number of new convictions, we see a very similar pattern. There seems to be a really big drop in the number of new convictions um, for those who were charged just after the date of the, the expansion. And again, we see the same pattern with um, those fast charges. So overall, what we seem to be finding here, and this is the, basically the regression version of, um, of those graphs, we find that uh, DNA profiling has a really big deterrent effect. It reduces the likelihood of a new conviction by 43%, the number of new convictions by 47%, which is huge. Like when I first kind of started down this line of work, I was like, there's no, like it'll have a little bit of an effect, but like this, this amazes me. Um, but uh, I think combined, like the US study and the, the Denmark study combined, at, at this point, like I'm, I'm convinced that these tools are doing something really good. Um, the effects are, are particularly large for violent offenders, but they're, they're, um, they exist for people initially charged with a property crime as well. Um, and the avoided crimes, the crimes that aren't committed now because they're deterred, uh, are mostly property offenses, just because most crimes are property offenses. Um, but there are some violent offenses that are being avoided as well. So it definitely seems to kind of affect all types of criminals and, um, and, and all types of crimes. Um, now, because we were able to kind of separate the detection and, and deterrent effects of DNA, we can actually come up with an estimate um, of, of how big a, a reduction we get for any, any increase in the likelihood of getting caught. And we find that um, a 1% increase in the probability of getting caught reduces the number of new crimes committed by 2.7%, which is huge in this sort of, um, in this kind of context. So it really seems to be super effective. Um, and as I mentioned, we, we link the data to, to information on, on residents and kids and marriages. Um, there's a little bit of evidence that it seems to affect the spillover, that the, the benefits of reducing recidivism to the spillover to uh, other parts of their lives. The biggest impact we see is that, especially for first time offenders, um, if they're added to the database and therefore now more likely to, to avoid committing a new crime, they're much more likely to be married going forward. So it goes up by about 46%. There's some evidence that for those, um, the non-first time offenders, the recidivists, um, they're more likely, at least in the first year, to live with the same partner, live with the mother, the, the child, um, with their, their children and their mother, um, but that seems to fade. So there's, like, there's some evidence something's going on here, but not, not as much as I think we'd hoped going in. So, so overall, what we're finding here is that uh, adding individuals charged with felonies to the DNA database um, has a substantial deterrent effect. As I mentioned before, this is the policy frontier in most US states. Uh, so there's a big Supreme Court case, Maryland v. King, a couple years ago, and the California Supreme Court recently decided uh, also that it was constitutional to add arrestees to the California database. Um, so this is, you know, it's controversial, and, and one of the big factors in, in each of those discussions is, um, is the public safety benefit worth whatever the privacy cost might be. Um, and, and I think this research suggests that the public safety benefit is pretty big. Um, and if anything, I think that it, it looks like the deterrent effects are larger for those charged with crimes than they are for those convicted of crimes from the earlier study. So the next question is really, you know, do those individual level effects, like that, that tells you something about what happens to recidivism among those who are, um, who've already be, been caught and been charged or convicted of a crime and what happens to their subsequent behavior. Uh, does that add up? Does that, does that actually result in a reduction in crime rates? Um, and it might not. It might be that there's just some sort of market for crime maybe and you take some people off the streets and new people kind of come in and take their place. So you might not see crime rates change. Um, there might also be, there might be bigger benefits than we might have imagined based on the deterrence because those people who aren't deterred 
might be caught more often and then put into prison and so they don't commit crime either. Right? So you could, you could imagine, based on the earlier analysis, you could, you could imagine the crime rate change being either smaller or bigger than one might, one might have imagined. So I can also use the, the timing of those database expansions to, to try to answer this question. Um, so uh, because each of those expansions basically represents a shock to like the, the, the size of the database, it gives you a little bit of a variation in, um, in uh, when people are added that isn't uh, strictly a correlation with how much crime there is. Um, so it turns out that there is a significant negative effect on all types of serious felony crimes, um, except burglary, oddly enough. Maybe that's the type of crime where there's actually a real market. Uh, um, but basically between 2000 and 2010, uh, in the data that I have, the average database grew by about 2,000 profiles per 100,000 residents. And that, that I find that, that resulted in um, a reduction in violent crime. It's a pretty big range, but at least 7% uh, and a, at least a 5% reduction in property crime and possibly much bigger. Those were, that's uh, crime rates. Okay, so but the reduction, is that in, uh, like arrest rates or conviction rates for the reduction? Uh, con uh, conviction rates, yeah, yeah. Um, and then so when we think about like how cost effective is this tool relative to other possibilities, because of course you, there are many different crime reduction tools one could employ. Uh, it turns out that the marginal cost, as I mentioned earlier, of DNA databases is really small. So in general, it's like $40 to run the, the test um, of the, the saliva swab. Um, probably even lower now and, and certainly getting cheaper. Um, and I find that, that basically, if you, if you uh, figure out kind of the social cost of crime that's avoided, or the social benefit of, of the, the crime reduction from the, the previous analysis, it turns out that each additional profile um, reduces the social cost of crime by about $1,500. In order to get the same benefit from other tools, from incarceration or from police, you'd have to spend a lot more money on incarceration or police to get the same benefit. So it really seems like um, DNA databases, if we think about how to spend kind of the marginal dollar, um, it's, they're super effective. Of course, DNA databases alone aren't going to work without police and, and prisons. So you know, there needs to be, uh, there's going to be their complementary, complementary effects here. But, um, but it definitely, you know, given the current system we have, it seems like the, the benefit from adding data, from expanding databases is, is really big relative to alternatives. And then, so how should we think about these privacy costs, right? Um, the costs of DNA databases that when we discuss these in the public sphere, it's not entirely financial. Um, you know, it, the, the government here is taking genetic material from individuals in order to generate that identifying profile. Um, and some people think that that is not a big deal, and some people think that's a really big deal and is a potentially a potentially real problem. Um, and so, and you know, there are privacy costs of a whole bunch of other tools. I personally think that surveillance cameras have a much bigger privacy cost than than this tool does, but people will differ on that. And I think the the way to think about this is, you know, once we have a, a once we're able to quantify what the benefits are, we can then weigh that against whatever it is in our mind. Um, uh, in terms of what, whether we think that's worth the, the cost. Um, and so if, if it turns out that we think that the, the perceived privacy of, um, the perceived privacy cost of, of an additional DNA profile is bigger than that $1,500 benefit that I found before, then maybe this isn't worth doing, right? But if we, if we think this isn't somehow, it's, it's less costly than that, then, um, then, then this is a pretty good bet in terms of, uh, in terms of um, the crime reduction bang that we're getting for the buck. And I think one additional, this is the, kind of the, the last thought I'll leave you with, um, you know, technology isn't going, to, isn't going to solve all our problems here, but one of the big conversations we're having in criminal just re justice reform uh, research and policy discussions is how to reduce racial disparities in a lot of the outcomes that, that we see. Um, I think there's, there's good reason to hope that tools like this will help reduce racial disparities in, in outcomes. Um, you know, right now, identification, or without, without these types of tools, uh, identification tends to be based on uh, you know, officers' investigations, maybe officers' hunches, eyewitness identification especially has been shown to be problematic. Um, and this is surely an improvement over those types of things. Uh, 
And I think it's important to keep in mind that our counterfactual, what we need to have in, in mind as kind of the, the alternative, isn't perfection, it's whatever was happening right now. Right, so this, these types of databases aren't gonna get us to a perfect system, but they can get us to a better system than we currently have. Um, and I think it's, you know, it, as I said before, it's, it's really the more we can kind of take the role of human discretion out of the process, the more, um, uh, the smaller racial disparities tend to be um, in, a, in a variety of different contexts. Um, so these studies that I've talked about can't speak to that issue, but I think it's an important area for future work. Um, and is, is really relevant to all, the, all of these surveillance tools that are becoming more widespread um, and, uh, and could potentially just reduce the, the, um, the harmful uh, aspects that uh, the human discretion can often play in decision making. So I will, I'll stop there and open it up to discussion, questions. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so the, the actual, um, like when the DNA is taken, it's a, it's a saliva swab, so it's well, clearly. Assume that the parents model in a rational actor yep. um, predicts that they knew there was this system in place. Yep. And they, but, you know, factored that into their logic. Do you have mm -hmm. any sense for any knowledge of the extent to which they were given warnings about this as they were being released or put on probation? Yeah, no, I don't have like, I don't, I don't know of any like actual data that can give us something like that. And my sense is that they're informed of why the saliva swab is taken, when it's being taken. Um, my hunch is that most people are learning about this type of tool from TV, rather than you know the newspaper or an official warning that they're getting from an officer. Um, yeah. Do you know, or do you have a sense of how the DNA databases might have overlapped temporally with other measures designed to reform the citizen race, or just reform the criminal system? Yeah, so, um, there's there's other stuff kind of going on in this in both periods. I think one um, what gets us a lot of traction in both situations is that is that that really sharp policy change on the date of their charge or release um, it isn't that type of, sh of sharp change isn't going to happen with any of the other types of policies. So if you imagine like maybe they hire more police officers or they change sentencing policy or whatever, that's going to apply to people on both sides of the threshold. Um, and but only the people on the one side of the threshold go in the database. So um, so any any of those other kind of background things I think should affect people, both the control group and the treatment group, equally. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of the turn back, um, and I'm kind of processing my thoughts here. Yeah. Is there some kind of comparative analysis to compare fingerprinting, for example? Yeah, so um, so I don't know of any studies on the impacts of fingerprinting uh, on on deterrence. Um, I think uh, you know DNA databases behave in a very similar sort of way as, as fingerprint databases in the sense that um, uh, fingerprints are also trying to match people in a database with fingerprints collected at a crime scene. Uh, the the science of fingerprint matching is um, much weaker. Uh, it's still kind of a very visual, like people just like eyeball it, <laughs> basically, right? It's not. This is a much more. Um, uh, the matches are much more exact with with DNA, um, and uh, and it's available in more settings. You can avoid leaving fingerprints by putting on gloves. It's much harder to avoid leaving DNA at a crime scene, um, and so so there's good sense, good reason to think that DNA databases will be much more effective. But it's certainly like thinking of it as similar to a fingerprint database is is the right way to think about it. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. And that's not a random sample. It's sort of like that rate of the likelihood of getting caught is not the same across income groups. Like yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Yeah. Um, I definitely appreciate the fact that it can actually like help racial yeah. disparities in other aspects. There does seem to be that sort of like potential that like it makes increasing disparities worse. Yeah. So I think the way I think about this is again the counterfactual isn't like the perfect system. It's what we have now, and I think that already exists to a large degree now, right? Like there are people who the cops already give a hard time to a lot and um, who are much more likely to be hauled in for crimes that they may or may not have committed. Uh, um, and uh, I think this will improve upon that system. I think, you know, if you are very worried about that and want everyone to have an equal chance of getting caught for their crimes, the answer is to expand the database to a broader set of people the, uh, of the population rather than to, to do away with it, I think. Um, politically, that's harder, yeah. <laughs> but I think that's the... Um, yeah, I mean, to the extent that, that a lot of people are, are currently not eligible for, um, for inclusion, if that's, if that's the concern, then there, there is an answer for that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, kind of along those lines, and I, I know that the data is probably not great, um, did you see any differences, if you had access to it, uh, between like uh, number of police contacts, like the ratio of police contacts to arrests, or the number of arrests to convictions, basically like, you know, is it significantly increasing uh, the chances of them like dropping charges versus actually like proceeding, you know, trial or try for conviction, or maybe even um, like you know plea bargain changes if they go for higher charges. I don't know. If that makes sense. So we don't have a lot of that data. We can look at the um, the change in the likelihood that a charge leads to conviction. We don't see. I mean, just in in general over this period, there's a huge increase in like database hits. Um, uh, but but certainly no like discontinuity in the number of of convictions per charge. Um, so yeah, I think most of the action really does seem to be coming through deterrence rather than the detection side. Yeah. Uh, I have a conceptual question about yeah. how you might quantify privacy costs of this, because unlike say closed circuit TV, which we would all have our privacy intruded upon, the groups that might expect. Mm -hmm. is I engage in criminal behavior, I have to do the swap, mm -hmm. and most of us do not expect that that's going to be the case. Mm -hmm. So there, you might get very different estimates of the value of the privacy costs across those different groups. Uh, yeah. Do you have any thoughts about how someone might make sense of that? Yeah. Um, and again, I guess I, 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 the way I think about this really is like relative to um, to the status quo, where I think the, the groups that are more, most likely to have their privacy invade, like this, a saliva swab and the, the government collecting a DNA sample to put in this database is probably among the smaller privacy invasions that, that most of the people who are in the database um, are enduring. Um, and so, you know, there are a lot of other factors in our criminal justice system that, uh, that affect, affect a lot of people's lives. Um, at a much deeper level, uh, so um, yeah. I mean, I think you know, they, there are certainly. I think most of the the scenarios people really worry about in terms of the privacy costs are more uh, more slippery slope type arguments. Like once we get comfortable with this, then once the science gets better, we might imagine allowing the government to analyze your DNA to see if you're predisposed to schizophrenia or predisposed to alcoholism or whatever else, and like putting you on a watch list if one of those things is true. Like you could imagine scientists saying like, that's possible, right? We could, we could think about doing that. That would make me uncomfortable, uh, much more uncomfortable than this does. Um, and so I think that's, that's, where, that's where I think the conversations would need to get a lot more serious. I think right now there is, I think when you talk to legal experts, they tend to frame this, like the taking, uh, being added to the database, they tend to think of it as a punishment. Um, and so, so a lot of the conversations, and I think the legal cases around whether people who are arrested or charged for crimes should be added to the database, um, the conversation is like, well, they haven't actually been convicted yet, and so this shouldn't have to happen to them. And it is just interesting. Like, I don't necessarily think of this 
as a punishment. Um, it just does, it's kind of, you've s signaled that, you know, some, but other people are, uh, have a, are more sensitive to the privacy costs in this, uh, in this space than I am. And so that's where, that's where in the end, I think how you think about whether the, the uh, benefits outweigh the costs is gonna be a very personal decision. Um, and so, you know, what I can do as an economist is just think about what are the benefits. We can, we can like, we can actually quantify that and then everyone can kind of come to their own personal decision about whether it's worth it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so my general sense is, um, you know, they, so obviously there are different contexts. So one's in the U.S., one's in Denmark. So, like, there are potentially a bunch of different reasons here. But I think it makes sense um, if you think about, like, the, the earlier you catch someone, the earlier you add someone to a database in their criminal career, the more, the more you're likely to impact their future behavior and the more likely that they might actually be be free and able to to engage in more criminal behavior right and so so if you can if people are deterrable if uh if you can kind of put them on a different track early then that's then there's a potentially much higher payoff than waiting until after they've committed murder um in which case they're locked up for the rest of their life anyway and so it's not going to have an impact um so that's that's the basic intuition i think for for why it makes sense that that um it could be really beneficial to to add someone to a database early rather than later. Yeah. I have a question um, when you're talking about violence versus property crime. Yeah. Does that make you aware of that Or um, does that change the The crime rates? Yeah. yeah. Yes, okay. you see our data. Then it's only showing you, like, so somebody might have committed several crimes. So the, the crime rate data, I think, is the number of reported crimes of a certain type. So, um, so the, I mean, the individual level data are going to be our, um, those are, um, it might still be the most serious offense, but that's not UCR data. That would be from the individual states, direct departments of correction. Right. Committed any crime. Any crime. Um, for the individual level, for the, the deterrence analysis, I was looking at, um, yeah, the, the likelihood that you commit any future crime based on kind of what your initial charge was that got you into the database or not on, in the first place. Um, and so if you were initially charged with a larceny, we see that over time, like, the deterrent effect seems really big. And that deterrence I'm thinking of as being, like, any future crime, not necessarily or any future conviction, um, not necessarily another larceny. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, any thoughts on how using our database has led to a reduction in wrongful convictions? And the reason I'm asking yeah. that is that I think if I understood you, I would find like two effects. In the database, we see more project costs. Yep. In the database, it has a deterrence effect, and you find a net positive. To the extent that there is a wrongful conviction goes down, mm -hmm. and if you think about the criminals being the prime suspects, they're more prone to be the wrongfully convicted, that would be pushing it towards an upward step down. So if I think, um, yeah. Just, that, that's why I'm asking. Yeah, no, I think, um, like, ultimately, like, you know, there are so many contexts in which we'd love to know, like, so are we getting the right people, <laughs> right? And here, I mean, it's just... It's just impossible to know. I think there there are some data sets out there that look at you know uh, number of exonerations, but it's not a random sample who gets exonerated. It's you know certain cases are appealing to the Innocence Project or whatever else, and um, and so uh, my hunch is that there you know where uh, uh, the um, fewer people are are reoffending and the matches that are you know the convictions that are being made are probably becoming more accurate, but 
unfortunately, there's just no way to be sure about that. Great question. So I just want to establish because there, there would be the goal would be hopefully that there will be fewer wrong mistakes. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the hope here is that it both, uh, and that's part of the reason you might be deterred from committing a crime. It's like it might be more more swift and more certain um, in the sense of of being uh, you're much more like much more likely they're gonna catch you rather than accuse somebody else. Yeah, that certainly would be the goal here. I'm going to suggest that we are past the hour. And so if you have remaining questions, maybe you can come up and ask Jennifer separately. Yeah. Please join me in thanking her for a wonderful presentation.